collaboration with the Cyprus Mail. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambus. This week we look in depth at the energy sector and ask what's happening to the funds we receive back from Europe. Electricity is going to cost more but the money will come back to the government of Cyprus, back from Europe, and should be used to improve our systems, to improve the grid, to pay for storage of renewables, and also part of the money should be used to assist vulnerable families who cannot afford the price of electricity as it is at the moment. And a Guinness World Record attempt will be made this weekend at the Mushroom Festival. One ton of mushrooms, 1,000 kilo. We have uh, built a custom-made pan that has a diameter of 4 meters. I think we all know that Cyprus has failed repeatedly in meeting greenhouse gas emissions as proposed by the European Union. And that is about to get even harder, because Fit for 55 is the name of a deal on stricter rules for member states' greenhouse gas emissions. All EU countries must reduce their emissions in line with a stricter trajectory. There'll be fewer possibilities to transfer, borrow and bank emission allowances, and we'll find out in a moment what that means, and... There will be more transparency, they say. Information on national actions are to be made public. Energy expert Charles Elinas joins us now to see what exactly this might mean for Cyprus. Charles, we already don't meet our standard emissions that we're supposed to, and this is going to make it so much harder. Do we have a hope in hell of getting there? Not if we carry on with uh, current policies. I mean, current policies do not respond to this. And um, Ursula von der Leyen's speech at the COP27, she is implying that uh, the 55% cut in emissions in Fit for 55, that's where it was his name, may go up. They are now considering increasing the target by a few percent. I don't know to what, between 55 and 60% maybe. And the uh, European Union only last week extended the cut of uh, targets, specific targets, for cutting emissions to buildings, to transport, to parts of industry, something that wasn't happening before. For example, the target for cutting emissions in transport was only 10%. Now, all of these areas come under a new target, which is 40% cut in emissions by 2030. Cyprus only had to meet the 10% cut in emissions in transport, never got anywhere close to it. And as a result, last year Cyprus had to pay a fine for not achieving that. Now that that target has been increased, we have no chance. I mean, we are so far behind on on climate change, on everything. We, we keep telling the world that we are achieving our targets. But we set up targets which are so low on everything, and we have been getting away with it up to now. But from now on, we will not be, be able to get away with uh, setting up low targets. For example, on this 40% cut in emissions in the areas I described, I mentioned, the European Union has specified targets for each country. So the, the rich countries have a higher target than 40% and other countries have less. Cyprus target is 32%, very high in comparison to the 10% we had until 2020. And there is nothing that has been announced in response to that here in Cyprus or appears to have been, we appear to have done nothing so far to respond to that 40 percent, that 32 percent. Well, we do keep saying that we're leading the Eastern Mediterranean region in sustainability and we have all these groups of three and four countries that it's Cyprus leading the way. I mean, how do we get away with that when it's quite obvious, if you look at the figures, that we are are nowhere near? So what you're referring to is that we're leading in terms of research. So Cyprus Institute 
has been at the forefront of research and it has been doing research in collaboration with many of the other institutes and universities. But research of the is region. no good, Charles, no, unless no, you implement the, course, the findings. But we are not doing it. I mean, Cyprus Institute has been at the forefront and they have developed yeah. a lot of new ideas related to climate change. Anastasiadis jumps onto that bandwagon and uses the words, but doesn't do anything. Doesn't do anything at all. All right, let's look at the timeline because you mentioned that different states are going to be asked to achieve different targets, and I think that is a sort of timeline starting in 2021-22 and then moving forward through the decade to 2026 to 2030, and each allocation varies. Hmm. Can we play catch up? We can, but we need to change our our approach completely. First of all, we need to um, have policies or laws or whatever we need to do to increase the uptake of renewables in general, but also specifically in electricity production. That's where at the moment a lot of our emissions come from. Uh, We produce, as you know, electricity by burning heavy fuel oil. The plan is that by the end of uh, next year, uh, we will have gas. If you believe that, you can believe anything. I don't believe that we will be able to achieve it. Burning heavy fuel oil is unique in the European Union. Uh, we're the only country, Mal- Malta has gone away, it used to be in the same league, but they are now importing gas. So we are the only country in the, in the European Union with heavy use of heavy fuel oil. Now, to to get away from it, we need to increase renewables in electricity production in a big way. And just as an example, the target for Greece is to achieve 61% of their electricity production out of renewables by 2030. Our target has been, so far, still 24%, and we don't appear to be getting anywhere near it, even though we still have time. 24% 24% is, is neither here or there. We need to respond to the targets that the European Union is setting up. I mean, for example, in the European Union, the target is 40% of all energy to come from renewables. That means that if it's for all energy, actually for electricity production, it has to be a lot more than that, like Greece. We're not doing anything to achieve that. Our neighbors, Israel, Egypt, actually are doing a lot more than we are doing in achieving these targets. We need to find ways to do that. Now, we produce the excuse that our systems, our grid are antiquated and they cannot take on that much renewables uh, because of stability problems. You have been saying that for 10 years. And done nothing and about we have, the grid. We're doing nothing yet about it. We have done nothing, we're doing nothing. We said we're going to bring in and implement electricity storage to help smooth out the ups and downs of renewables. We've been talking about it. We have done nothing so far. But the other thing is, we keep saying we're going to get our own gas. Why don't we just go ahead and import gas like Malta has done? Well, we have gone ahead and, as you know, we set up this project to import LNG and... um, I mean, I'm not going to talk about uh, the project itself because I talked many times about it. It's uh, Are we any closer to that? I mean, we spoke so about three theory, months ago, I think, about what was going on or not uh, down that it, dirt road in the Limassol area. What's happened? So they promised us that the electricity will switch to gas or the gas will be importing gas by July next year. Now that target has again moved Now it's end of 2023. Why? Because they haven't achieved anything and they say it's due to the pandemic. But it's not. There are problems on the project and I I even doubt that uh, we'll achieve 2023. In the meanwhile, there is another option. If we import LNG, will be expensive. I mean, you you, you know the price of of gas in Europe at the moment will be subject to the same kind of pricing And those prices will stay high, not just to the end of 2023, but beyond, maybe until 2026. So importing that gas is going to have cost implications. But we have another choice. So the Greek company Energian, that is producing now gas in Israel, 
I don't know if you heard, they proposed to bring some of that gas to Cyprus, bring a floating liquefaction platform, liquefy the gas and export it to Europe. But in doing so, they also offered to build a slightly bigger pipeline and bring gas sufficient to supply Cyprus and at what, a lower price. What did we say? We're still thinking about it. <laughs> I mean, that price, so Europe is paying exorbitant prices for gas in Egypt and in Israel because they produce their own gas. They're paying something like $5 per thousand cubic feet, uh, about five or six times less than in Europe. We could benefit for similar type of prices. So Energian, because they have to pay for the cost of the pipeline, they have been offering gas at $7 instead of $20, $25. We are thinking about it. We haven't done anything yet. It hasn't been rejected because the first time Energian proposed it quite a few, year, a few years ago, it was rejected outright. This time it hasn't been rejected outright. But whether it happens or not, I, I have my doubts. How far could the opening up of the electricity market here change the picture? And I'm asking you that because not so very long ago, I spoke to the chairman of the relevant House Committee and I had a bit of a go at him about why this was taking so long. It's now six, seven years since they've been talking about it. And he said, as I recall, that the legislation wasn't yet in place. So I tasked him with the fact that he's the chairman of the relevant committee. Why wasn't it in place? Because the rules have not changed in the last several years. So why haven't they got on and done it? Would it well, make a difference? Well, I'm not so sure. First of all, it's not just the legislation. It's also the systems. I mean, the, the software they need to use, the, the systems they need to implement to free the electricity market... It's not available yet, even though they have been working at it for the past, uh, whatever, seven, seven, years, or seven something. years, they're not ready yet. Ah, it's not that it's not available, it's that no, we no, haven't done the job yet. They, we have not prepared ourselves yet. The DSO and, and the people responsible for freeing up the electricity market, actually doing it in practice, not just in words, uh, are not ready yet. They say they're not ready, Charles. Is this the bottom line that they don't want to do it? And why? I don't know if they want to or don't want to, but um, there is a suspicion that um, maybe we don't want to. I, I don't know why. I don't know why not. Because um, there are companies, as you know, who are ready to go ahead and uh, build plants to produce electricity privately and sell it to the system and provide competition within Cyprus. And a lot of them, I think, have been licensed to do that, but exactly. they're unable to do it because no. of this, we're not ready yet. And I, I talked to one of them not that long ago, and um, he, he was running out of words to describe his feelings, because he exposed himself by going ahead, uh, setting up the project, finding the technology, the funders and everything, and now he's in a limbo, because he has all these commitments, and... He can't proceed. He's waiting. How far is this a chicken and egg thing? I mean, if we go back to what you said about increasing renewables, first of all, the environmentalist in me gets very angry when I see huge areas of our forests in the mountains being cleared to put solar panels, when if you look around the towns or the motorway, there are concrete structures already in place that if you covered them with solar panels, the car parks of every supermarket, I mean, they're small, but the sum of the parts would make a huge difference and surely feed into the grid if the grid was ready and you say it's not. Well, we also have vast amounts of land which is non-arable. It's uh, you can you can drive in areas where you see just chalk, white chalk everywhere, and uh, nothing grows. So not even not even trees grow there. I'm so afraid, why don't they use those areas? I don't know, and maybe the the reason is because of the the grid being unable to accept electricity just anywhere. Uh, because our grid is, is, not, uh, is, is, is not updated, is not upgraded. So can we look at this from a logical point of view? The first thing from what you've said is that we need to jolly well hurry up and get the grid ready for what we need to do. How long would that take? 
not very long uh, because and, and the, the money in a way is there often the excuse is that the investment is not available actually it's there the money we're going to receive from the uh, recovery and resilience fund from europe part of that can be used should be used for that purpose the other uh, source of money that can be used for that purpose is the money we collect from um, allowances for emissions eac pays for the cost of emissions by buying allowances but actually that money is, doesn't go to europe is returned back to cyprus and this year given the the cost of uh, each uh, unit of allowances which is very high the government probably will collect anywhere close to 300 million euros well that the, should sort out the, the grid shouldn't it the emissions trading system of europe the manual itself says it's voluntary though it's not uh, enforced by law that about 50 percent of that money should be used on renewables and and projects like upgrading the grid i would put money on the fact that it hasn't been no we're not nothing it, it, it goes into the government's coffers so we now hear that the government has a surplus and that's what it's feeding it's feeding the surplus instead of actually being used to improve our systems. Right, what about the change that is planned to the emission allowances? It says in the Fit for 25 that there will be fewer possibilities to transfer, borrow and bank emission allowances. How is that going to affect what you've just been talking about? The need to buy allowances will be still there because uh, as long as we emit, we need to pay for the emissions. That system that Europe is about to introduce will probably push the prices of allowances even further up. So, in effect, Cyprus probably will get more money. The electricity is going to cost more, but the money will come back to the government of Cyprus, back from Europe, and should be used to improve our systems, to improve the grid, to pay for storage of renewables, all the good things you need to do so that you can increase the uptake of renewables in, in this country. And also part of the money can be, should be used to assist vulnerable families who cannot afford the price of electricity as it is at the moment, and they need help beyond what they are receiving at the, uh, right now. So the, that, that money can't be used for that purpose. It can't be used to pay for everybody's electricity, but provided uh, it's focused on vulnerable consumers, it's possible to do that. So we're not doing it. We, we haven't got The finance system. minister told me a couple of weeks ago that they'd done everything that they could do for vulnerable people. No, and afraid. then he went and spent how many million on defence equipment? Yes. No, I'm afraid that's, that's not correct. He hasn't done everything he could have done. Because the problem we have here in Cyprus, we, we are an island and behave like an island. Don't, don't look at what is happening in the rest of Europe. If we just look at what the rest of Europe is doing, and try to emulate that, we will be much better off. I'm afraid we we do not. We find excuses, ministers find excuses. Nobody understands this field very well, at least uh, not as well as they should. And we buy whatever is given to us. We don't need to go very far. We should use Greece as an, as an example for us. And Greece in terms of renewables, has done tremendously well. I think it's, it's ranked non, number nine in the world, the ninth country in the world with most renewable uptake. Why can Greece do it and we cannot do it? Why can Greece set up targets over 60% of electricity coming from renewables and we cannot do it? Why Greece has uh, implemented all the systems to free up its electricity market and now the electricity is being traded freely and why can't they do all of these things and we cannot do them ourselves we don't need to go very far we just learn from greece and copy greece we don't need to start i mean we say that we can't free the market because we haven't developed the systems why should we sit down and try to develop the systems ourselves and not Borrow theirs, borrow theirs. Oh, their ideas and, and at adapt. Least. Borrow theirs and adapt it to, uh, obviously, our system is not the same as Greece, but we can adapt it. But we're not very good at taking up best practice from other countries here, no, are we? we know better. 
Unfortunately, I think that probably says it all. More transparency is the other thing that Fit for 55 says. Information on national actions to be made public. Now, we're not very good at that either, because when it came to the Aarhus Convention before the Agamas plan, my freedom of information request to the Ministry of Interior came back with an answer saying that this was confidential and this was classified until the plan had been approved. So that's totally against an EU convention, and I can't see that we're going to be any better with transparency in the electricity market. I'm not very hopeful either. It's not that Cyprus doesn't have the, the laws and the systems in place, because as a member of the European Union, we have to implement all of these laws that the European Union is introducing. We just don't apply them. We have them, but we don't apply them. We find reasons why not to. So I don't expect that um, freedom of information is going to produce anything. I mean, you see it uh, daily on everything on this island. There is no no real freedom of information on anything, let alone on energy. A final word from you as to what, if anything, you think can be done to improve this situation so that we might not only meet EU targets, that's not the main thing, it's actually about improving things here in Cyprus, isn't it? So this government is, is going out. Nothing is going to happen. It is switched off a few months ago and it will be switched off until the new government comes in place in March. What we should do and can do is to press all the presidential candidates to take clear positions on these issues, on what they will actually do to change things. Let me stop you there. They've all taken positions on something, but as far as I'm aware, perhaps one, perhaps two, have actually explained to voters how they will achieve what they say they're going to do. But it's down to the voters to keep asking and down to the press and the media to keep asking and keep pressing. These these issues are not just side issues, they're fundamental to our life in Cyprus in the future. Being within the European Union means that we have to follow European Union laws and requirements and examples and everything else. It's, It's going to be forced upon us. Why should we just wait until we are forced to do it and not do it proactively? We, the voters, the media, everybody needs to keep pressing these issues and expect the candidates to come and tell us, not just slogans, exactly what they are going to do to implement these things. We have a chance to force these issues out, to make them central to the elections. And as a result, we can then have whoever is elected, a base to ask for that to happen. Because if they promise all of these things before they're elected, they will be expected to deliver. And then we we will have a chance to keep pressing to see delivery. This is our chance now during the elections. Otherwise, if we don't do it, I'm not very hopeful. I think uh, the status quo will carry on. Well, the candidates have about three months to get their act together and tell us how they will implement all these amazing promises some of them are making. And it's been a pleasure once again to talk to energy expert Charles Elinas. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. This is the Cyprus News Digest with Rosie Haralambas. Coming up this weekend is a mushroom festival. It's being organised by Kiriakidis Mushrooms, whose director, George, joins us now. Now, I think, George, that apart from all the different types of mushrooms that you produce, you're also going to have an attempt at a Guinness World Record. So do tell us what people can expect if they come and join you in Spilia Village this weekend. That's right. We have the Mushroom Festival this weekend on the 19th and 20th of November. This year will be the fourth year that we're hosting this annual event. And uh, we uh, are attempting uh, to have uh, an event that's so much bigger this year. As you have mentioned, we will be attempting a world record for the largest serving of sautéed mushrooms in the world that's ever been attempted. We will attempt to do this uh, together with the local community of Spilga, 
where the event will be hosted and along with the Cyprus Chefs Association. Am I right in thinking you're going to cook 1,000 kilos of mushrooms? How long has it taken you to grow 1,000 kilos of mushrooms and keep them for this attempt? That is literally one ton of mushrooms, 1,000 kilo. We, for this um, target, for this uh, attempt, we have uh, built a custom-made pan that has a diameter of four meters. The whole uh, attempt will be done in one single pan. We've set the bar quite high and we're very excited that we uh, are going to attempt this record and we'd like to invite everyone to come uh, and be a part of this. Once we're successful, we will... Uh, all enjoy this uh, wonderful meal. How long has it taken you to grow a ton of mushrooms? Well, uh, in our farm, which is located in Limassol, we grow mushrooms on a daily basis. So we grow 11 different types of mushrooms, seven of which are certified organic. These sort of quantities are manageable for our farm. So you've got the thousand ready for the event on the weekend, but you've uh, still got to keep supplying all the people that you do supply, which is pretty exactly. well everyone in Cyprus. Well, planning, planning production is a very big part of what we do. So actually the mushrooms that will be used for the attempt will be harvested on uh, Thursday and Friday, so they will be as fresh as possible. Tell me a bit about the different types of mushrooms, because a few years ago all we ever saw was the ordinary little button mushrooms or whatever, and now there are so many different varieties. What are the differences in terms of how you use them? Because I'm sure you're a cook as well. Yeah, well, <laughs> we love growing mushrooms and we love enjoying them as well. But you're right, in the past consumers were mostly exposed to or interested in white mushrooms, but as time goes by and as we get exposed to different worldwide cuisines and as people start getting more interested in what it is they are actually consuming, we see that there's a lot of interest in different other more exotic types of mushrooms. So uh, apart from the white mushrooms, we also grow the oyster mushrooms and the portobello, which are also quite popular nowadays. But also other types such as king oyster, shiitake, yellow oyster, lion's mane, which is getting a lot of interest by people and culinary professionals alike, maitake and uh, ganoderma. Most of these mushrooms, the white, the oyster and portobello uh, have now become stable in most supermarkets. The remaining mushrooms are mostly used in, in sort of uh, specialized restaurants and professional chefs. So what do they use the different mushrooms for? Because they taste differently, don't they? There's a, exactly. there's a very exactly. subtle flavor difference. Exactly. Actually, in biology, uh, mushrooms and fungi are a different kingdom compared to plants. So every mushroom is like a different, a different uh, type of vegetable. So each mushroom is different. Each mushroom has its own texture, its own taste and can be used in, uh, in different dishes, can accompany different dishes. Will the people who visit the festival over the weekend be able to taste these other mushrooms as well? A lot of our mushrooms can be found in supermarkets or uh, more uh, specialised supermarkets and also because a lot of consumers are interested, a lot of people are interested in these more specialised mushrooms. We have also set up a new shop on our website where we can deliver at home, directly at home. So even if people find it difficult to get small quantities of mushrooms that may be interesting to them, they can go direct to our website and we can deliver at home. And finally, I think it's not just about the mushrooms. You've got children's activities and educational exactly. talks and so on. So give us a little bit of a rundown on some of the other events happening over the weekend. Exactly. So uh, because last year we were thankful for having a lot of people visiting us, uh, it was um, a lot more people than we expected. We received a lot of love and a lot of excitement from people about this event. So this year we uh, decided to give it our best. So we are welcoming everyone, we're welcoming adults, we're welcoming children to join us. We will have uh, a corner for children, we'll have bouncing castles, we will have face painting, balloons. For our friends that are interested in wild mushrooms, we'll have lectures by professionals. We'll have uh, 
works in the forest where people will be able to hunt, let's say, for uh, wild mushrooms and learn about recognizing the different types of wild mushrooms. And that's very important, isn't it? Because some of them are an absolute no-no. So this is all happening, I think, from 10 in the morning until what time on Saturday and Sunday? All right. On Saturday, we begin at uh, 10.30 and we expect uh, to go on until about 6 o'clock in the evening. And on Sunday, we start at 11 until 6. The pan will start heating up at around 11 on Saturday. So the record attempt will be done on the Saturday. We expect to start sauteing the mushrooms at around 1 o'clock and hopefully between 2 and 3 o'clock we will weigh the mushrooms so we will have the certification of the world record and then we will start serving the sauteed mushrooms. So it could also be called how to cook a ton of mushrooms in an hour. Yeah, well, that, that, that's going to be something, isn't it? It certainly is. It's been a pleasure talking to you, George. Thank you very much for joining us and the very best of luck with this weekend's Mushroom Festival up in Spilia village in the Trudos Mountains. Thank you so much, Rosie. Thank you for having us. Well, that about wraps up this edition of the Cyprus News Digest. Many thanks for your company. Hope you'll join me next week. Till we meet again, take care and God bless. Bye-bye now.